So we'll take some time for some questions, um, given that we've heard from both the resident perspective and the faculty uh, perspective. There was one, uh, one question posted to the chat so far, looking at um, and thinking about one of the common themes that we hear talked about, that balance between um, the win in that we have more flexibility, but the attrition or worry of attrition for physical exam. Um, physical exam. So how do you, in uh, working with residents or as a resident, how do you balance um, guiding your learners about the appropriateness of when to bring a patient in or see the back or help them understand um, their uh, ability to access patients for in-person exam? I think that's a great question. It's something that I think we all struggle with uh, over time. Um, you know, my approach really is one of an evolutionary uh, uh, approach. Um, you know, I mean, every patient encounter is going to be different and, and understanding that there will be uh, limitations in any type of a particular encounter that you have and the ability to be able to um, partake in certain elements of the, of the traditional assessment are, are, are really uh, really just something that you have to uh, understand and certainly uh, acknowledge. Um, uh, part of this is uh, developing a sense of acuity and also the expectations of the patient themselves. And so it is somewhat a negotiable uh, um, uh, you know, interaction and negotiable set of uh, um, elements that you really can't plan for in all instances. There are encounters that are very readily amenable to um, deferring the physical exam and comfortably so for example reviewing uh, investigations and those uh, you know those sort of uh, um, very goal-directed types of encounters uh, and then you know highlighting that primary purpose to the trainee really does help crystallize the fact that you know this is very much a uh, specific uh, focus of the encounter and then of course there are the other encounters where there may be concerns that uh, that uh, obviously would be um, better served by a physical assessment and uh, thinking of vir the virtual care evaluation as uh, as a mechanism of identifying these patients and um, you know using that as a as a segue into other mechanisms of evaluation that are more appropriate so it's developing a bit of comfort and also understanding that there are going to be limitations in every type of encounter including physical uh, uh, physical encounters in particular ways uh, and using some of the um, opportunities provided by a virtual uh, care environment to be able to better own the skills that help one identify the patients and negotiate the, the expectations for that particular encounter. So in psychiatry, we do very little physical examination. Um, strange, but it's true in North America. Uh, but our assessment when it comes to bringing somebody in face-to-face -face or in person is very pertinent to when it comes to risk and the measure of risk. How a person is an acute or immediate risk that need to be physically in a medical facility or not. And that's something that we have to assess and it's a learning skill as well uh, for the learners and for us to see when can we say, this is an emergency, we need to get you into hospital or we actually have to call an emergency services. But that will be no different than when you do it in physical space because a lot of the clinics are community-based clinics and the bringing in somebody for an urgent assessment in a hospital will be no different uh, in a principle. I think that's such a valuable point, thinking about um, providing feedback to learners in this new context and environment around that sort of idea of sick, not sick, um, appropriate virtual visit versus perhaps could be enhanced by physical exam and needs to come in and making it okay to make that transition and are making our learners feel safe with that feedback and giving permission can be such an important part of providing feedback. That's fantastic. I'll take a pause to see if there's anyone who wants to unmute or ask a question um, or give people a chance to type into the uh, chat box uh, if they've got a question that's bubbling up for them. I was going to say as well from the, the resident perspective, um, I found that when we have these virtual uh, clinics, but then still some in-person clinics and deciding who to um, bring to which clinics, I found that I do um, really focus my physical exam learning on those times where I have uh, in-person visits. So 
I think about all the physical exam skills I need to complete. And now in rheumatology, there are quite a few of them. Um, and so I, I really try to optimize that time when I am physically uh, in person with those patients versus when I'm in the, the virtual setting, I'm kind of focusing on other skills as well. So trying to sort of divide um, my goals between those two different types of clinics. I, th I think that's such a valuable point, Heather. Um, you know, really, it, it's 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 seductive to think of virtual care as an either or. Uh, um, you know, either virtual care or uh, physical assessment, um, but they're not necessarily sort of independent. Uh, uh, you know, mechanisms of evaluating a patient. They're they're very much interrelated, and they're just simply tools that uh, have a particular place in a particular set of patient characteristics and contexts of evaluation. And so um, one really should be very comfortable or develop a comfort in, in interchanging between those types of assessments to really provide the breadth of uh, evaluation that, uh, that, that serves the patient best. Obviously, during the pandemic, the physical evaluation is, has been much more restricted uh, uh, and, and certainly um, very much uh, in the way of sort of a rarer resource. But there is nothing to say that uh, one cannot uh, and should not readily transition between those ideally and focusing their, their attentions. I agree. And I think the other piece of your comment that I really like, Heather, is around the idea of being an owner or an active participant in educational planning. So really knowing yourself and where you're at in your trajectory and taking that time to um, optimize that learning experience when it's available and knowing where your needs are um, so that you can be an active participant in getting those needs met. So I, I like that sort of balance that I hear you talking about, which is so important for our learners to have as they engage in medical learning. I would love to hear about sometimes my experience in virtual care and providing feedback are there are certain domains that um, do very well with feedback and there are other domains that I might struggle with. So for example, I find I oftentimes can give um, structured feedback around um, clinical expert or expertise or knowledge um, when I'm watching an encounter. Um, I found niches or new areas to explore the role of communicator in virtual care. Um, are there any particular roles that you find are easier if you're sort of new to giving feedback in um, virtual care or other roles that you've stretched or grown to as you're providing feedback? in? I, I would agree with that. I think um, you know those those domains are certainly uh, amongst the easiest. Um, there is the possibility of of transitioning to other areas, and and I think you know over time as more and more of us are immersed in virtual care and we have this obligatory environment uh, of evaluation um, and assessing patients. Uh, I think the creativity element will continue to uh, enhance the versatility of how this is applied and by the same token enhance how we evaluate and how we provide feedback to our trainees and um, you know I, I think really you're you're essentially limited only by your imagination particularly in certain domains um, but uh, obviously some lend themselves much more readily uh, to uh, to assessment and evaluation than others. Other domains I find as well we can evaluate and provide feedback is the, the role of a manager. Uh, so I ask the trainees and the resident to look into virtual resources and when do we budget and say we want to send somebody for a lab test and what resources are available, is it necessary, but also can they do something from a distance without having to, let's say, use PPEs because they have to come into a physical building. So the role of a manager and knowing where resources are, the role of an advocate as well. Sometimes as well, the resident will say, well, this person is really needing to be somewhere. And yes, it's a pandemic time, but I need to make sure that they get the best care. So that's another role we really can evaluate using the virtual care and it really lends itself well to that assessment and uh, feedback. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Zina. I think uh, certainly the pandemic has created some of these uh, inherent uh, managerial uh, necessities, um, but virtual care in and of itself uh, in non-pandemic times, I think, has also uh, created the need to um, uh, be uh, uh, specific about your managerial role. So, um, especially, you know, related to some of the logistics in getting patients to have certain types of tests, especially if they're at a distance and may not have access to particular types of tests, particularly specialized testing, 
um, and uh, also trying to make sure that you're continuing to provide optimal care, uh, I think it really does lend itself nicely to, um, if not sort of an equivocal uh, mechanism of uh, that managerial role, at least uh, a context specific um, way of um, promoting uh, the managerial skill development. Thank you so much to this expert. So we're going to now flip from feedback into the assessment side of the feedback and assessment continuum. So our first speaker is Dr. Joe Lee from KW. He's going Kitchener Waterloo. He's going to talk to us about assessment um, in the family medicine domain. Thank you. 